Well, thanks, thanks everyone for for having me here. Uh, I rushed in from London to New York to present uh, to present the same paper. Uh, this is joint work uh, with Alfred uh, Alfred Lihar from Calgary and Christine Parler from Berkeley, and we are going to you know delve into a microstructure problem, which is liquidity provision, and in particular how to fix costs on decentralized exchanges like gas fees, impact who provides liquidity and where. So, you know, to this audience, it comes as no surprise. Decentralized exchanges are increasingly important in the crypto space, right? They trade over $100 billion each month, and with the peak, that goes up to like 200 or more. And the dominant decentralized exchange is, is Uniswap. Not only are they big, but they're also quite liquid, at least in the pairs that matter, right? So this is by a recent study from, from August by Kaiko, Showing that for you know USDC against against ETH, that on Uniswap around the, the midpoint is you know an order of magnitude larger, like ten times larger than on basically most centralized exchanges. So they are important. They they have a lot of volume. They are also deep, um, but they have one big caveat, which is the fixed cost. Right? Every time you trade or every time you provide liquidity on the centralized exchange, you need to pay a gas. I will argue that there are fixed costs in liquidity provision that go beyond that. And you know, this gets back to you know, one of the most fundamental questions in market microstructure, going back to the 70s. How are we dealing with transaction costs in market and what do they imply for the quality of our markets? And, and Uniswap is a, is, a, is a unique laboratory to answer this you know, deep economic question because sort of liquidity providers are on one side, liquidity demanders are on the other side, and because it was designed with transaction costs in mind, right? Originally, the V2, the Uniswap V2, was designed for passive liquidity provision, right? You just set it and forget it, just as you would do with an ETF, because you don't want people interacting all the time with the blockchain. This sort of changed a couple of years back when Uniswap moved to V3, where you know you can set price range for your position and managing liquidity has become costly. One explicit cost for actively managing your position is the gas price that you have to pay every time you interact with Ethereum, even layer two chains. Uh, a second more subtle cost, if you want to take a step back and you think, oh, these markets are really designed for liquidity providers to, to interact with, for retail liquidity providers to be on these markets, well, these guys are not professional, right? So they're, you know, fixed costs in times of the time you need to spend to monitor the market, the effort, the know-how to have, you know, the steep learning curve. Right? So it's not just gas fees, it's fixed costs from a broad perspective. Uh, how do DEXs work? I'm sure everybody in this audience is already familiar. You have on the one side of the market liquidity providers, and these guys will mint or add liquidity to a pool, right? Usually they will add both tokens. If you want to trade dollars against ETH, you will put a quantity of, 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 of both on the liquidity pool. And when you do, you put in a gas because that's basically paid to the, to the network, to the validators. And when somebody wants to trade, right, let's say they want to buy ETH, they will swap in, they will put ETH in the pool. Sorry, if they want to buy ETH, they will put dollars in the pool, they will take ETH out. They will also pay a gas cost to the validator, and they will also pay a liquidity fee to the liquidity provider, which sort of stands in for, you know, essentially the spread to compensate for adverse selection, to compensate for inventory risk, and to compensate for the gas cost. And every time liquidity providers need to update, they have to, they have to pay that cost. And the fixed cost of supplying liquidity, the gas fee for a mint transaction, right, is quite substantial economically. So here we're plotting over time the uh, average of the, the cheapest 1,000 mint transactions on, uh, on the Uniswap B3. And you can see that you know costs could like, easily have exceeded 100 bucks back in the day. Now they are a bit lower, they're like five, six dollars, but they can spike when you know, there's like a big event like the Luna collapse or well, whatever stable coin uh, would, would depeg. So this is, Sorry? Units are dollars. Yeah, units are dollars. So this is not trivial and you know it's time varying. You have a lot of time variation in, 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 in the fixed costs. The fixed cost is fixed because it doesn't depend on the quantity you're putting in, but because it's fixed over time. 
And why would you need to actively manage liquidity? Well, because Uniswap is free, allows you to sort of set the prices in between you're willing to trade. And when you know news happens and the true fundamental value sort of moves out of this range, uh, you want to sort of move your liquidity provision, otherwise you're not earning any fees. So active management is more of a core of V3 than it was, for example, with V2. What Uniswap did when they moved to V3, they said, okay, every asset pair can be traded in one of four pools with a liquidity fee of one, five, 30, or 100 basis point. And at the time, the thinking of Uniswap was, well, you know, every pair is going to converge to one particular fee level that's more appropriate for that. Like stablecoin, stablecoin pairs would go because they have very little volatility, very little risk. They will go to the one basis point, something that's trading between two unknown tokens uh, that has a lot of risk might go to 100 basis point. So the idea is that will consolidate. What do we observe in practice? We observe a lot of fragmentation, especially for the big pairs. And not only do we observe fragmentation, we observe fragmentation with a very specific pattern. Uh, Take, for example, you know, USDC against ETH. We see that across the sample, most of the liquidity is locked in the high fee pool, which is in this case the 30 basis point full. Well, but most of the trading actually happens in the five basis point full uh, uh, pool. So that's the low fee pool. So you know, the natural question is why is there so much money being locked in a pool where there's not a lot of trading? And what we show is that the answer to this question is fixed costs. And fixed costs create clientels of liquidity providers. The people that are providing liquidity on the five basis point pool and the people that are providing liquidity on the 30 basis point pool, they're not the same kind of LPs, right? The small LPs, the, you can think of them as retail maybe, they're more passive, they will step back, they will go on the high basis, high, high fee pool, the 30 basis point, they accept being filled much less often. They don't trade very often, but when they do, they get a higher fee. And they have to rebalance less often. And that's really important for them. They're not in there to always fiddle around. And the big players will go to, will be competitive, will go to the low fee pool, and they will just move around their liquidity a lot. There's a growing literature of this. I'm coming from the econ space, so I'm, I'm citing most of the econ papers. Uh, you know, people in the, in the audience have, have contributed to this. And we also relate you know, to a more classical market microstructure liquidity, uh, market microstructure literature. Okay, so I know this is a session about empirics on blockchain, but let me uh, walk through a model. We have a very simple model. There is only one token, uh, expected value V, trades on two liquidity pools, uh, fees high and low, they're both positive. We abstract from any sort of like AMM pricing curve. It's cost and value, linear pricing curve. Uh, price is fixed. We don't care about that in this particular paper. And every time you interact with the pool, you have to pay a gas fee, a fixed cost, gamma. And we have a continuum of liquidity providers. And these liquidity providers have heterogeneous endowments. They're all risk neutral. And their endowments follow a, Pareto, a bounded Pareto distribution. What does it, what that's try to capture we have a lot of people that are very small. Think of it, many, many retail traders. We have a few people that are really big, right? Because they're like the whales, the professional funds that want to play in this market. So that's how we create heterogeneity. On the other side of the market, you have liquidity traders. These two come in two particular flavors. You have a flow of small liquidity traders. These guys arrive at a constant rate, theta. They're very small. They can't really impact the market themselves. They will optimally go to the low fee pool, right? That's where their, their cost of transacting is the lowest. From time to time, with a Poisson process with intensity lambda, you get a huge trader. That your trade, that huge trader will basically consume liquidity on both pools. That leads to the creation of liquidity cycles. Right? Look at the low fee pool. You can have a liquidity cycle where small traders are coming continuously. Then they sort of deplete the pool and people have to rebalance. Uh, on, the, on the high fee pool, 
the 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 the, uh, the pool only depletes when the large guy comes in and basically consumes the entire liquidity. Yes. So I think we're missing a major effect here, which is that uh, you're saying that people will only trade on an IP pool if they want to do a large trade. But in reality, um, because the um, this mid market price of the two pools vary, people will also small traders will also trade on the large B pool simply if the if the, the effective price is the same. And in fact, because there's order routers, order routers optimize this, right? So I'm I'm wondering how you can sort of talk about this without sort of thinking about the mispricing, the relative mispricing between the two. Um, that's true. In reality, this will depend on. On the equilibrium supply of liquidity on both pools, that will determine the 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 the, the price impact you're having. Um, point is, the mid prices are, are going to be different, right? So if I have a five basis point pool and a thirty basis point pool, and suppose I'm buying, but the mid price on the thirty basis point pool is twenty five basis points left, they'll both look the same. Are you talking about mid, pri mid prices, or are you talking about the price impact if you're just so trying to work the order? So let's say I'm a very small trader, and I'm going to have these two pools as an option, and the spot price on the 30 basis point pool, excluding fees, is 25 basis points left, right? Then my expected price on both these pools is the same. Okay. And if I have five basis points to one and I have 30 basis points to the other, I get the same price, right? Okay. So I guess my point is that small traders will also trade on the on the big pool because you're not accounting for the fact that the I, uh, I see could be we, we don't see that much divergence in prices empirically. And we do see empirically that the distribution of trades sort of fits what we have here. Like most of the small trades go on one and maybe some trades, the big trades go on the other. So I, I see what you mean. Um, that can happen. It doesn't happen very often. It could happen that the price impact, that the total cost of working the order is such that you might want to, depends on the liquidity supply. Maybe we can take it off. Yeah, time. yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, it was a little bit of a spike when we talked about there are people on the garbage project. Of course, things that are smaller are going to fall outside of the market are going to fall much more often in case they are larger. And in fact, uh, they have order routers, right? Like, uh, you might even trade on both pools and small trade. This is the same thing. So, um, it's often the case that the current pool has higher liquidity, a lot of price impact. So, uh, even if you have higher fees, that's like. So, yeah, it's. it's Right, because um, the following two problems are equivalent under no transaction fees, which is uh, you provide liquidity onto kind of a bunch of small pools, right? Or you provide liquidity into one big pool, which is probably why you don't see price consolidation except for, or sorry, uh, liquidity consolidation, except for this like one small thing, which is gas fees. Like, yeah, well, the model is sort of like designed in a way to sort of highlight the effect of gas fees. So that's why we're sort of shutting down price impacts and we are assuming that arbitrageurs are keeping the price in line because there's no price impact. There's no cost for them to, to do that. Right, so that we, we shut down price impact in this case. Okay. So if you're a liquidity provider, what's your problem? Your problem is to choose whether to provide liquidity on each of these pools or to just stay out of the market. And what you're trying to maximize is your expected profit per unit of time. Right, so if you go to the low fee pool, your profit is your endowment times the low fee until you basically your position get traded out, minus the fixed cost every time you know the cycle ends if you rebalance, divided by the duration of the cycle. The same thing for the high fee pool, and if you stay out, your outside option is is zero. The only thing that's endogenous here is the duration of the cycle, and the duration of the cycle depends on how many other people provide liquidity, right? Because everything is prorata in this, in this market. So for the high fee pool, where the liquidity only gets depleted when the, 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 the big guy comes, the duration is just the sort of like expectation of the, of the, of the person arrival process. For the low fee pool, well, the, the duration is shorter because you don't only have the big trader that might come in, but you also have this small flow of small traders how fast does it get depleted? Well, it depends on how many liquidity providers are there in the first place, right? Uh, so there's a trade-off between either going to the low fee pool, so you get, uh, sorry, if you go to the, to the low fee pool, then you get the low fee, but you get it more often, the duration is shorter. If you go to the high fee pool, then you get more, uh, less often, and also you, you save on the gas fees, which is gonna be central in, uh, in, in, our, in our paper. So we, we show that there is a threshold endowment such that everybody with a large endowment who can afford to sort of like 
manage their liquidity fast. They can afford a, a, a fast cycle, a low duration. They will go to the to the low fee pool. They basically provide like liquidity competitively, and everybody that's small enough and they really want to save on the fixed cost, uh, they will go to the high fee pool and accept being executed less often. And the marginal trader solve this uh, this equation here. It's a very ugly equation, but it only has one one solution. Okay, so that's sort of the equilibrium graphically. You're going to have very, very small LPs that might stay out of the market altogether because they just can't afford to pay the, the gas fees. Small liquidity providers that will go to the high people to save on gas fees and the big players that are going to go to the... To the... I guess another bottom question is, if you have a high fee versus low fee, in the high people, you have much less adverse selection than the low fee, right? That's true. Is your model capturing that? The model is not capturing that, but we're good looking at it empirically. And we see a two basis point sort of difference. Yes, true. In, uh, in, in permanent loss. Well, I don't, I don't know how you're measuring it, but I mean, people have looked at like certainly the five basis point pool, and that one systematically loses money. And the 30 basis point pool also loses money, but like much more steadily, right? So I, I think the numbers are much, I mean, I don't know if it's two basis points on a trade, they, they lose. On a daily basis, on average. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, that might be more reasonable, but it, but it should be that the two basis points different, meaning the, the low fee pool is two basis points more. Uh, the low fee pool is two basis point less adverse selection. The low fee pool has less adverse selection. Yeah, which I think is consistent with the fact that the small traders, the uninformed traders, will root there first. No, but it has much more arbitrage activity. I mean, empirically, that, that can't be true. I mean, I've looked at B3 and, and uh, the five basis point pool systematically do this much more. But okay, we can, we can talk about it. Maybe we, we measure it differently. Or maybe we're controlling for, for, for other things. Okay, let's get to the to the data. So we collect data from the subgraph on all the trades, liquidity deposits, withdrawals for basically since inception till July, mid July 2023, all the trader wallet addresses. We proxy the gas cost as the average of the lowest thousand daily mints across the across uh, V3. And we're we having some criteria to filter the pools. There are many pools with no sizable activity. We want pools that are active in more than 100 days within the sample that have at least 500 events during this two-year period, uh, have an average daily liquidity balance of above $100,000, and they constitute more than 1% of volume, right? So if you have a pool with uh, 50, 49, and 1%, we're just keeping the 50 and 49. Okay, and we obtain 274 pools in 242. So you can see that most of them are actually not fragmented, but the biggest ones are. Uh, aggregate volume of these pools, 1.12 billion, total value locks, 2.5 billion, and these pools account for like more than 85% of everything that's going on on Uniswap. Okay, so what do we see? We see that on the low fee pool, the average mint is high, right? They're the big liquidity providers that can just put more at once. They, they tend to go to the low fee pool. The average trade size is much higher on the high people, right? The big traders, empirically, they tend to go to the high people. And the low trader, the small traders, they, they go to the low people. But the, the number of trades a day, there are many more trades in the low people than on the high people, right? So what does this tell us? It seems that on the low people, you have uh, many smaller trades, and on the high people, you have few large trades, right? And that's sort of in line with, with, with what the model does. Yes. So I think, I guess I'm talking about the first uh, okay. quadrant. Yeah, a lot of uh, LPs in the small fee pool are directional traders. So basically they create an LP position not to generate fees on the back and forth thing, but they just want to get directional execution. And it's almost impossible to trade directionally as a maker in the 30 bips pool because you have to have a very wide position and you can only position, you cannot position close to mid price because you don't want to be in the active game. You have to be a little outside. So I think that that is a very, uh, this empirically from the data okay. I've seen, this is a very important difference in terms of the LP clientele uh, between low fee pool and high fee pool. And I'm wondering if you want to also isolate those directional okay. traders. So we like focusing on LPs that pose like a two-sided. That, that would that solve. I uh... post two-sided. Okay. 
you exclude the guy, uh, the, the people who use uh, very short range positions close on one side, very close to mid price, because this is what directional traders usually do. They go to the bin that is next to the active one, they use short range, and they just put a lot of uh, uh, weight into that. So this is when I see that for low fee pool, you have very high, um, uh, very yeah. high things. So this is those positions can be just directional. Okay, thanks. Uh, the Sunni is mentioning I have five minutes left, so I'll I'll try to go quicker through this, and and I can take any questions afterwards. So this is basically the sort of a regression analysis for what we're doing. Low peoples have higher mints. This is in logs, so this is 73% higher uh, mints, lower trade sizes. Low people in generally trade about twice as much. Uh, and they produce liquidity yield and compute liquidity yield in a very simplistic way. We just take the fee revenue divided by the TVL. Uh, two basis points higher on the low people compared to like a basis of 10 basis points a day. And they tend to post narrower, narrower position, which is on, in our mind is consistent with uh, being more willing to actively to actively manage. Okay, so is this about gas fees, right? Because the, the whole story is about fixed costs. So let's think in theory, what would gas costs do? Well, if the gas costs increase, people need to compensate for that, right? More people become small relative to the high fixed cost. So we should see the, the, the market share of the, 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 the low fee pool drop as people migrate to the high fee pool, right? And at some point there is a crowding out effect. If the gas cost increases up above a certain threshold, people will start you know stepping out of the market altogether. But still this will lead to a higher market share for the high fee pool, lower market share for the low fee pool. And that's what we see in the data. Right, so we see that the low fee pool has 20%, 21 percentage points lower market share in terms of liquidity, about 24.6 percentage points higher market share in terms of volume. Right? So this is like the first graph I showed you. And then you can see that the gas price drives some of this difference, right? One standard deviation in increasing the gas price leads to Basically, a uh, four point six percent decrease in the liquidity market share of the of the low fee pool, right? And similar number for the for the volumes. In terms of liquidity flows, if the gas price increases, then you see fewer mints, right? In in terms of dollar, in terms of like probability of having a list of mints in the low fee pools, much more muted effects for the high fee pools because you know as people move into the high fee pools, other people might be crowded out of the market because of the high gas stream. So again, this is consistent with what happened in the model. And the last piece of evidence I want to show you refers to the cycle, right? The, the liquidity cycle, the duration, how active and passive are these guys? So what we see is that people on the low fee pool, they actually rebalance much more often, right? The time between a consecutive bint and the burn by the same person, is much smaller on low people than high people. And a lot of the time when this rebalance happens, it happens because the position is out of range, right? And that's when they, you, you, want to, you want to move around. This effect also seems to be driven by gas prices, right? At least partially. So you see that the liquidity cycle, the mean burn time is around 500 hours. So that's, I don't know, 20. 500 hours is like 10 days, 20 days. Uh, and on the low people, that's 20% lower. And the higher gas price actually makes the cycle shorter. And why does it make the cycle shorter? Well, as gas price increases, the liquidity supply on the low people drops, which means that it takes fewer trades to deplete, it, to, to deplete that, which means that the rebalancing frequency must increase. And that's what we find here. And not, there is no action on the burn to mint time, right? The time between you burn and you remint your position at a new price, uh, that doesn't seem to be affected by the gas price. You do it pretty much immediately, 10 minutes or so. Okay, now in terms of adverse selection, we're back, we're going back to your question. So we are looking at impermanent loss for a position you know, around the current price. Uh, so we're basically just looking at the, the midpoint now, the price, the pool price now and the pool price in one hour. And we're computing the impermanent loss. And you know, if we don't control for anything, we 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 get what you what you say. 
that the low people has more adverse selection. But on, but we think that this is sort of mechanical in some sense. Once we control, because there, there's simply times where nothing happens. When we control for the, 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 the trading activity, uh, the effect flips side. So now we can talk more about whether we should control for trading activity or not. Um, but that, that's what I felt, because if, if you don't control for it, they're just empty, empty periods of time where nothing happens. Uh, so if you put everything together, I'll be just done after this. Uh, the liquidity yield, which you compute in a very simplistic manner, is about two basis points higher, two basis points a day higher in the low fee pool. The uh, permanent loss, uh, with the caveat of how we're computing it, is 2% higher on the high fee pool. So that sort of leads to a four basis point net difference in cost, which we think the, the small retail traders are willing to accept because they're saving elsewhere, in particular, they're saving on the, on the fixed costs. Um, and that's what I have just to wrap up. Well, the centralized exchanges were supposed to sort of encourage passive liquidity provision. Uh, with the introduction of Uniswap v3, uh, there is a need to actively manage. And we show that if you throw fixed costs in this equation, you actually have liquidity clientels. Right? And uh, what we're working on now is to see, well, this is, is this a welfare cost or not? Right, but you do get these two these two groups that are separate and they differ in their willingness to accept high co fixed costs. Thanks a lot. I'm happy to take any questions. Too. There's more time. Yes. Uh, did you look at the, any of the low ups by any chance that also have AMMs like Uniswap? Because the gas fees are a lot lower. Uh, we didn't. Uh, there is another paper by Olga Klein that looked at basically either pools versus arbitrum pools. Uh, they find results that are very similar to what we would expect. Much more concentrated liquidity in one pool. There's not as, as much fragmentation. And all the liquidity concentrates towards the low fee pool. So that's if you want sort of like an extension if you move the gas fee lower. So we they find it the same thing. Any other comments? Oops. We haven't, I mean, we, we tried, obviously. When we started the model, we tried to solve it. We decided we get much cleaner expressions for the same insights if we have a linear price curve. But the, the main problem if you have this is, is obviously the math becomes much more tricky, and then you have to compare the actual price impact. So the routing decision becomes much more complicated. Empirically, we tend to see, you know, so that's consistent with the model, right? If you have a large trade, that's when you're more willing to accept to accept the, the, the high fee. It could happen that there are cases when it's not, but I think as a first order approximation, our model captures this sort of dynamics. Thanks. All right, thanks, thanks a lot.